One of the most important elements once we talk about option pricing is modeling of volatility. Um, volatility, we have already discussed volatility in previous lectures once we introduced Black Scholes model. We also look at the pricing of uh, all input options. Um, this lecture will be a summary of what we have learned so far, and also uh, we will learn about the limitations and efficiencies of the Black Scholes model. Um, we start today's lecture with uh, key elements um, that we have learned so far about the pricing of derivatives. Um, I will talk about the implant volatility and also how to compute implant volatility from the market. So as you can imagine, uh, in the market, if you buy an option or you sell an option, we don't see volatility. It is a price. However, it is often uh, um, the option prices are represented in terms of volatilities. So here we will discuss how to move, uh, how to switch, move between prices and implied volatilities. Uh, why the concept of implied volatility is so important is that uh, imagine you have two stocks, a stock of a value of a 1 and a stock value of a, a 100. Um, if two stocks move by 1, essentially first one moved almost 100%. The second one moved only by 1%. By switching to the concept of implied volatilities, we don't really care about uh, the movement, we care about uncertainty. So then, uh, uh, and this is basically uh, a concept that is well accepted in the financial industry. Um, okay, well then after talking about uh, implied volatility, introduction of implied volatilities, um, I will show you how to implement an uh, algorithm that, they, that allows you to compute uh, implied volatility in an uh, efficient manner. Then we will have some extensions of the um, Black Scholes model. So here we'll discuss what is the advantage of uh, extending Black Scholes model um, and introducing volatility parameter, which is not constant, but it's time dependent. Um, then um, the next point will be about uh, implied volatility surface uh, and how implied volatility surface fits to the Black Scholes model, how we can use Black Scholes model to generate implied volatility surface. And today we will finalize this lecture with a uh, uh, few points about the uh, downsides, limitations of the Black Scholes model, and how we can improve in general modeling of uh, volatilities using alternative models like local volatility or stochastic volatility, or for example, by extending the model with jumps. So um, I hope you will enjoy this lecture and I will hope that you will learn uh, a lot about that. Let us summarize what we have learned so far about pricing. Uh, first of all, we start with a specification of a payoff. Uh, in this case, what we see, what we have learned so far, we have a payoff that depends on the stock and a certain maturity time t. That means this payoff is of European type. Depending on the payoff type we have, we need to specify a model that can be used to price this contingent claim. Um, in at this point, we have a very simplistic payoff. So this is a European type option. So our model does not need to be you know, too complicated. In this economy, so in this model that we'll, we'll be using for pricing of this um, derivative, we have two assets. The first one is money savings account, and the second one is stock. As you can see that in the stock is specified under the P measure. Uh, it doesn't really matter how you specify what type of parameters. At the end, you have to make sure the system is brought under one measure. But we can start always with a specification of a model under P-measure. And further on, uh, once we have the system of differential equations, we have a payoff uh, using a portfolio that we have discussed already in, a, in previous lectures. So if we construct a portfolio consisting of an option that we sell and delta times stocks in order to patch, so by constructing a hedging portfolio, we are able to arrive at the pricing uh, PD. Uh, this pricing PD, as you can see, does not depend on a new parameter, on the drift of, uh, of a stock. So that means whatever drift we specify here, this will be in one present in the pricing of uh, uh, pricing equation. Uh, next step, second law, is that once we have a pricing PD or given payoff, we can always, using a feminine cut steer, we can switch to calculating of an expectation. 
So this is uh, often much more handy uh, because if we would like to solve a PDE, uh, in this case, of course, we can do it analytically, but in much more generic case, we have to do it via, via uh, partial differential equations, by discretization techniques. Uh, this will be also to some extent the class later in this lecture, uh, in the course. Um, however, uh, much more uh, suitable, much more good is to deal with expectations because expectations allows us to solve either integrals that we will discuss later, or by we can get this expectation by solving uh, by simulating by uh, using Monte Carlo. So here we, we our economy uh, does not depend on a, a stochastic interest rates. We have a deterministic interest rates. This means that discounting is outside expectation. We also notice here that expectation has to be taken under risk neutral measure. This means that the process that we have here, we cannot just simply take a process, this process which is defined here, because this process is under P measure. However, in this expectation, we can only use uh, SDE, stochastic differential equation for stock, which is under measure Q. And this is very important. We already have learned that if you like to switch from measure P to Q, uh, under this model, uh, the following quantity, so it's a discounted stock process. So this quantity needs to be marked again. This will imply that mu will turn into R. And this is uh, in, the, in detail discussed in the previous lecture. In general, this condition, uh, it can be applied to any system differential, any equation for stock. Um, even in large and high dimensions. So once we have a representation using payment cuts theorem, where we can switch, we can switch from into uh, expectation. Uh, then we, using uh, the the quantity, the quali quantity that we have discussed here, we need to also specify the process, and this process is specified is given here. So under Q measure, the stock process instead of mu will have other. And in order to switch, as I've shown before, this quantity has to be marked. OK. Uh, so this is uh, our pricing equation. Uh, we can either solve this expectation using simulation, like for example, Monte Carlo. What but we can also do, we can uh, calculate integral. So expectation is simply an integral over a payoff, which is here, times the density, probability density function, uh, with respect to this. So here, don't be scared. This is actually here, we, we say it's a transition a part, uh, PDF, but in essence, in, uh, in our case, our T is typically T0. So this will be transition from zero. So it does not really matter. And we can consider our transition to be just simple marginal distribution. So once we have a distribution then function, uh, probability distribution function for T, then we can simply substitute to this integral to calculate this expectation. Uh, you can also say, see that we, we integrate with respect to dst, so with respect to st, but this is just a value. So it could be you can also write this expression as v of uh, t x of s of x dx. This is equivalent representation. So don't be confused, don't be scared that you see here uh, ST. Uh, and this will be density EDF of S. So it's equivalent with this formulation below. Now let us return to the pricing equation using Black Scholes formula. As we have already shown before, uh, Black Scholes formula allows to price European call and put options. Uh, using closed form. So the expression for pricing of, uh, of these derivatives is in closed form. Um, here we show equation for a co-option, but very similar equation corresponds for put options. Um, in essence, we need to own a few in elements. There's very simple, fo simple formula that everyone can implement even in Excel. It relies on initial stock, uh, normal CDF, which is evaluated at point D1, D1 is essentially just a function of model parameters. And then we have a, a minus exponent of interest rate over the time to maturity. So time from today until the maturity of the option. Time strike. We have also second time uh, normal CDF 
with a point with a function d2, which is a function of d. So as you can see, it's a very straightforward formula that allows us to uh, to compute uh, prices using uh, using Black Scholes. Uh, let us summarize uh, what are the parameters of this model that we can actually estimate. We we need to estimate, or we need we can um, those are or the parameters that are given from the market. So let's take a look here. So first parameter that we have uh, is time to maturity, so T. So in the previous slide, we had a T and capital T. Uh, time to maturity, in essence, is described by T minus T. So this is today, you can think of today. And T is the maturity time. And this term represents time to maturity. So, of course, if you buy or sell option, we know exactly when the maturity is. So, this is parameter is given. Then, if we think of a buying or selling an option, we also know uh, what is the strike. Strike is given in a, in a contract specification. We also know interest rate because interest rate is uh, it's not dependent on an option, but we can simply get it from the interest rate world. So that parameter is typically given. And when we think of a pricing options, this parameter is, is not so relevant, especially these days when interest rates are close to zero. Uh, and current the line price as zero is also known. We also we always know what is the current value of a stock that our option depends on. And only one parameter that is left is sigma. So this is a uncertainty parameter, it's a volatility parameter that we need to estimate given uh, market prices. Um, what is important to, to realize is that if we look at this equation, this equation always will be increasing in terms of sigma. So it's a monotone function of sigma. This means that once we have, uh, uh, once the uncertainty increases, uh, then option value also will increase. So this is something to, to always to keep in mind. Um, and uh, since it's monotone, so it's, there is always a one-to-one -one correspondence between uh, option price and volatility. So volatility increases, option prices also increases. And uh, of course, and otherwise it also works if option price increases and every other parameter stays the same. This also would imply that volatility that we uh, use in the model, so the sigma that we use, it is also increasing. Of course, the question is how to get this parameter. Uh, is it given? Is it something that we can simply calculate? Uh, this is actually the objective of today's lecture. So let us take a closer look on the slide that we have seen already before. This is a, um, a slide representing implied volatility uh, from Reuters. Reuters is a, a data provider that is used in financial markets. So this is... Um, a screenshot of uh, options, calls and put options for S&P index. This was taken a few days. Back. Um, the spot value, as you can see, is uh, 3,800. And here we have uh, uh, some information that you would like to right now decode. So uh, first of all, we see that we have different maturities. So those are the, our T's. So it's here, it's March, here is end of June, September, and so you see that options in for this MP index are spaced quarterly, quarterly basis. Um, then we see also here, so on the left hand side here we have calls. So if you go from this direction, it's calls. Here we have puts. Uh, strikes are here. So whole column here is strikes. So for every call or put, we have corresponding strike value. Uh, then we have uh, uh, so on. We have also price, so this is bid ask spread. So if you want to buy, you always have to pay a higher price than um, the price that you can sell. So the difference between the two is always a spread. Uh, and we have also two important elements. Uh, the first one is sigma uh, imp vol mid and delta mid. Mid would basically correspond that uh, uh, the sig or vol implied volatility is calculated based on the mid price. Uh, this column actually here is very important, corresponds to our sigma from Black Scholes model. So uh, if we see market implied volatility, always think about Black Scholes implied volatility. 
this is very crucial. Often when uh, this is a kind of a trap that you can uh, you can fall. Uh, suppose they give you a model uh, which is not Bachelor's model but has many parameters, and I will ask you to compute implied volatility for that model. So if a model has more than let's say three or more than one unknown parameter, you, students typically are confused which parameter corresponds to the implied volatility parameter. And actually that's a trap because when we think about implied volatility, it's always black source implied volatility. What this means is that even if you have a model of 20 parameters and you need to calibrate all of these parameters to the market quotes, once we speak about implied volatility, we always speak about black source implied volatility. So how to, if you have a model with many parameters, how to get that implied volatility? And this is the follow, following procedure. If you have a model with many parameters, you compute option price for those parameters. So you have a price. Then you use this price in a Black-Scholes equation to get your sigma implied volatility. So it's always intermediate steps. So whatever model you choose, it always has to pass a Black-Scholes model. So here we see that for every, every strike, we have a volatility. What is also kind of, uh, not surprising, but this is what we can observe, is that for every strike, we have a different implied volatility. So this is, and if we would plot this, we will get the following picture. We will get, uh, if we have here strike K, we have an implied volatility here in this axis. You can see that we have uh, here 20.4, and here's 20, it's on 20. This would be this kind of shape. And here we have a quantum line. So it is not constant. And this implies that if you would have a Black Scholes model and you would like to calibrate to uh, use the model to price multiple options with different strikes, we could not use this model because this model would not be able to fit to multiple parameters. As you can see, if I change strike, I would get different implied volatility. This means uh, for different implied volatility, this means we will have a different price. So, so uh, implied volatility uh, using Black Scholes model uh, is not the same, so it changes. Another parameter that you can recognize is uh, uh, delta mid. So it also corresponds to the mid price. So this is mid is always a mid price. But delta here, in this case, it is delta that we have used to compute arbitrage-free value of a portfolio. So we construct this portfolio consisting of option plus, or actually minus delta times S. And uh, once we compute uh, for Black Scholes equation, the value, the dynamics of this portfolio, delta, which will be equal to the partial derivatives of a value with respect to stock, this quantity is presented in this table, in this column. So this is something that is very uh, important. And actually you can see that market convention when we talk about the pricing options is purely determined by Black Scholes model. Of course, to summarize very importantly, uh, Black Scholes model cannot be used to price all of the options at the same time because for different strikes, we have a different parameter. So it means if I'm interested in this particular, let's say option, I can only use this implant volatility to price it. What is also important, or maybe you can notice here, so if we have a short maturity option, so we have uh, 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 three months from now, around three months from now, the range from the highest to lowest volatility is a zero point, around 0 0.4. If you look at the longer maturity, this range becomes better. So further we go in time, much more uncertainty is, and the volatilities become higher. So very present here. So uh, time, uh, longer we have to wait, uh, typically is associated with higher uncertainty and then implied volatilities that we see are also high. Okay, um, here's another example. So illustrative example, uh, how what is implied volatility and how to input it? Because right now we know that um, this parameter that we have seen here corresponds to Black Scholes implied volatility used for computation. But now we need to uh, find out a way how to get this from market data. So let's consider the following example. Suppose we have given a standard call option, VC, 
on hundred shares. So typically, when you think of uh, pricing of an option, it's always in the batches of a hundred. If you have an index like S and P, then you have an index only on uh, the option would be only on one in, in index file. Shares of a company Z. The strike is seventy five and expires in fifty five days. The risk free rate is five percent. The current stock price is eighty five dollar. And from historical data, so very important here, from historical data, we have obtained sigma historical equals to 0.25. So it's 25% volatility we have estimated from historical data. So once we have all those parameters, we can use Black Scholes equation to calculate value of this option. So the call price using Black Scholes equation is simply 10.86. But in the market, the price of a call is equal to 12.25. Of course, the question is, what does it mean? So uh, market says it's 12.25. However, we have estimated using historical data that should be 10.8. One can think that this is an arbitrary opportunity because we can, you know, obviously, you know, market is uh, selling at a higher price that we have estimated. So we could sell in market and, uh, or yeah, we could actually sell it and wait until those two volatilities will converge. And, however, this is not really proper uh, way, and this is not an arbitrage, what we see here. Um, the tricky or the most important part of this uh, estimation that we have done here is that we have used historical data. So it is backward looking estimation. So we could say we uh, estimate on historical time series. So it's called realized implied volatility. However, market is not looking at the past. Market is all forward looking. Maybe you have already heard this expression. Mar market forward looks what's the future expectation of cash flows. What is the future value of a derivative? So future value may not may have nothing to do with the past. So this is not an arbitrage opportunity here. Uh, however, uh, I know for the fact that some hedge funds and some um, people, uh, many people actually look at those impact volatilities because the, 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 the relation between the two, so if you look at the forward implied volatility and estimated from historical data, uh, some people think, believe that they should not be too far apart. So if you look in the past and you see what future tells you, um, there should be a relation. And many people uh, consider this as a good strategy for investing their capital. Um, I personally don't recommend this idea. Uh, it is more of a speculation rather than a real science. Okay, so of course, now the question is uh, how to use this formulation to find out. So if you have a market price, 1225, how to find out what is the sigma, not historical, but sigma implied. So we are looking for sigma implied. We are looking for sigma parameter in the Black Scholes equation such that would give us the price of 1225 that we can see in the market. So we have the following. So based on the standard Black Scholes pricing model, we find the volatility implied the market to be 43. So this means that if we would use this implied volatility 43.89% and we would plug into Black Scholes equation, then we would end up with a 1225. And this is what we see here. So if we have a Black Scholes equation, sigma market, so sigma market or sigma impl implied, we have the, the remaining parameters are given in the market. So it's interest rates, time to maturity, strike, and initial stock. If we plug in all these parameters, we have 1225. Of course, the question here is how to estimate this uh, this volatility such that actually we can calibrate the market call. So this is uh, the key element, key question that we have to ask yourself. If I give you price of an option and I give you specification of a contract, how can you calculate implied volatility? And this can be done in the following way. Uh, first of all, maybe uh, let's, let's, let's think of a concept of implied volatility. And here I would like to use the um, quote from Rebonat from 1989 who says, implied volatility is the wrong number in the wrong formula to get the right price. Uh, wrong number is basically, uh, we don't know what the correct number is, so we are looking for a number that we don't know what is which one is the correct one. We use it in a wrong formula, 
wrong formula means that Black Scholes model is not the real model for option prices. We don't know what market model is using. We just have a model that we have specified. We have specified a model with geometric brown emotion dynamics, but we don't know whether market is actually using that. So it's our simplification. So we have a real formula in which we are plugging wrong number to get right price. And right price is the price which is given in the market. So this is an uh, uh, interesting relation. Uh, so mathematically, we have the following. Value of a call, we can call it BS, which is abbreviation for Black Scholes, which has multiple parameters, C, R, T, K, S, G. And Black Scholes is monotically intrinsic in C1. So Black Scholes value is monotic and increases in C. Higher volatility corresponds to higher prices. So what we have to do, um, we have to assume, okay, so we first, um, if it's monotone, very likely we, its inverse exists, but mathematically we need to assume that in, inverse indeed is existing, such that, so if we have a, an inverse of a, a Black Scholes equation, we have the following. So we need to find an inverse. And of course, we already discussed that uh, prices and implied volatilities are uh, linearly related, not linear, but they are monotone. So if prices, if volatility increases, prices also increases because it also comes from arbitrary free modeling the assumption. So right now what we need to find out is the inverse of a Black Scholes equation. So we need to find out sigma in terms of um, by calculating the inverse of Black Scholes equation, which is given in this. By computing the implied volatility for traded options with different strikes and maturities, we can test the Black Scholes model. So we are able to check if we have this formula we have derived, we can check whether you know, market prices correspond to the uh, model prices that we have calculated. Okay, so what is how to calculate this is, is the following step. So what we do, we uh, set up the following equation. We take a Black Scholes equation, which is with an uh, unknown parameter sigma, and we have a market price, which is given here. We are searching for sigma such that this equality will be equal to zero. If we have sigma for which this is equal to zero, this sigma imp, it will be a volatility, implied volatility for the Black Scholes equation. We have, essentially, it is an inverse problem. So we search a zero for which uh, this equation will be equal to zero. And for that, we, can, we have done many routines how to do that. I also know some uh, very smart, tricky ones, uh, which are extremely fast, uh, but this is outside of today's uh, lecture. Um, the, the most common ones are the newton robson that we will discuss today, and also Brand's method. Um, what is maybe worth to mention is that, for example, market makers, so companies which are specializing in uh, uh, option trading, they put a lot of attention on very fast computation of implied volatilities. And it's not about uh, seconds, it is really about milliseconds. So faster uh, you are able to compute implied volatility, then you can find out whether there is an arbitrage opportunity or not, and you can use that for, uh, for profit. So it is really about milliseconds in the context. So let us take a look now how to derive the algorithm that would calculate implied volatility. Here we will follow a Newton, Newton Robson's approach uh, for calculating this iteration process. So we start with a function g, so this is our target, and we assume that this is differentiable. This is necessary condition for this algorithm to work. Uh, in the case of Black Scholes model, that's not a big problem because we know that uh, it's a smooth function and obviously it is differentiable. And now we define an epsilon n, which is the difference between exact solution and xn uh, um, iteration. By using a Taylor uh, series expansion, we have the following uh, expression. So 0 is equal to g x at exact. So if we have a solution essentially it's equal to zero because our function, uh, our objective is to find a function for which Black Scholes implied volatility is equal to uh, market implied volatility. So the function G is essentially uh, G of X. It is uh, Black Scholes 
Black Scholes of x minus v. And x in this case is a sigma. So also sigma here. Okay, so then if we write a, a Taylor series, we have the following uh, um, se sequence of terms. So we have a gxn plus epsilon n, which is essentially this term here. First derivative plus epsilon n uh, squared over 2. And second order terms, and of course, we have much more terms. And if we forget about the second order and higher terms, so we just concentrate on, on these terms. Yeah. Then if we substitute here epsilon n, so we have an ex minus xn, we substitute it here. We will end up with the following expression. So uh, x uh, exact is approximated by xn minus gxn and first derivative uh, with respect to xn. So of course, if we we know that it's a, it's not going to be the first term is not going to approximate the solution well. So we can actually define here instead of x, we can have an x n plus one, and this is what we have here. So we end up here, this uh, representation shows us what is the iteration that we should follow to compute uh, uh, to compute uh, sigma implied volatility for actually x n plus one. So we have to compute this iteration multiple times until the, the function g, it is close enough to zero. So this is kind of iterative process that we have to we need to implement. Of course, the question is how good is the approximation and what error do we generate? So um, if we take the also additional term here, we can actually end up with the following uh, error estimate. So we see that error uh, epsilon n squared, so this is this term squared, times second order derivative and divided by first order derivative of function g. So this is an estimate that we have for, for an error. Um, so how this procedure would work, because if we look at this iterative process, uh, it's clear that we uh, every new xn will be estimated. So every new step will be estimated on the previous one. So we're kind of updating our uh, guess. But we always have to, we have to start with the initial guess. So uh, this is quite, in the Newton Raphson algorithm, it's quite important that initial guess is uh, sufficiently good. This means that if we have we are in a space where the solution is very flat, uh, the convergence will be very uh, difficult. So in, often, actually in practice, it sometimes happens that Newton Raphson does not converge if the volatility are, we are trying to compute is extreme, or the prices that we are using. So, for example, it is extremely out of the money option. This means that we are really far away. The value of an option is close to zero, and for that. Uh, uh, for that reason, we may end up with uh, difficulties to obtain implied volatility. So if we have an option which value has, is very close to zero, so imagine 10 to minus 5, 10 to minus 6, if we increase volatility, that may not change significantly the option price because we are really far away from the main distribution where the most information is around. And that means that the function that we are um, uh, we are looking when we are looking for implied volatility is very flat. Then the gradient it's not very steep, and if the gradient is close to zero and it's not steep enough, uh, this method may not converge very well. So often what people do, uh, they define uh, a grid for initial guesses that are used for Newton Raphson. And then uh, a few iterations, one algorithm succeeds, then no say, more, more attempts are made, but if algorithm fails, this means that initial guess is not good enough, and then uh, your algorithm will then uh, choose for different initial guess. Okay, the function is then approximated uh, by its tangent line and it computes the x-intercept in this tangent line. So, uh, like I said, it is defined by the gradient and the steeper the gradient, faster the convergence. Now, suppose we have a function g in the interval a and b, I mean, it has uh, real values, is a differentiable function. From basic calculus, this is what we can compute. So, um, you assume here that uh, uh, g, x, n, plus one is equal is equal to zero. This is like we hope, we hope our objective is that the next iteration would give us a target function equal to zero. And we end up with the same expression as we have arrived here. So iterative process 
what if we have xn plus 1 x will equals to xn minus and we have a ratio of g function and first derivative of g function with respect to x okay um, this will work for arbitrary uh, initial value x0 but like i told you uh, in, uh, in practice if the gradient is very flat so this is close to zero this may not converge and uh, converge very well okay and now um, we have to substitute of, of course now we have a, a newton robson algorithm but we need to use for black scholes input volatility so function g in our case it will be sigma right so the function g is defined as sigma and we have a black scholes sigma minus the market vc and um, so this is what we see here so we have iterative process not for x but of course sigma n plus one equals to sigma so this is the same correspondence here here we have a gxn which essentially it is this function n below of course first derivative with respect to sigma this term will be gone because it's constant market value market price for an option is a constant it's just a number so this means we end up with the first derivative of black scholes equation with respect to sigma n uh, this term is uh, known analytically and is actually called viga viga is a is a sensitivity of a black scholes uh, option to volatility so viga is always sensitivity to sigma parameter this is how you should think about it. okay let's take a look how the convergence works so if we are getting what is the error that we generate if we are getting closer and closer uh, with higher and uh, higher iterations so equation one so equation one is uh, is this term so she uh, uh, we ignored uh, all h squared terms so we expect the error x n minus x x x squares in n uh, as n increases to n plus one so this means that once we have a higher uh, uh, next iteration, the error will be uh, squared. So we have this the following following order. So n x plus one minus x exact is equal to all x squared because it's squared. So you see we have n exact and we have a one step we have made. And because we if ignored higher order terms, this means that all the error will be squared. Um, the analysis can be formalized to give the following results. So this is a tier which specifies how exactly this error uh, it's uh, limited. So you can see um, that x n plus one minus exact is uh, equal or less of constant times the difference between x n minus x. So it's a previous iteration squared. So this is uh, this is what we uh, have from this tier. So now let's take a look uh, how we can perform implementation of a Newton Robson in Python. So this function is available uh, also for you to be attached to this lecture. So um, I have prepared uh, a few methods, a few definitions that are used to compute to compute uh, impact volatility. Uh, first of all, we start with a definition. So in this code, we will rely on two libraries, NumPy and of course SciPy. Uh, then we specify market price of a call price of a call option. So this is the, the, the price that we would see in the market. Then we have a strike, which is specified in, uh, for, partic for this particular contract. Tau, which is tau to time to maturity. Interest rate, initial value of a stock. And we have a sigma int, which is an initial volatility parameter that is used to, you know, in the uh, liberation routine, in the optimization. We can also specify a CP, so it's a either a call or put option, and that is used internally in the population. It doesn't matter whether you use a call or put, um, the, the procedure is exactly the same. Okay, um, before we go to the core, so the implementation of, our, of the calibration routine, uh, now let's take a look what are the, the main ingredients. So already we have seen in the slides that uh, our Computation relies on two evaluations. Uh, our target function, which is the Black Scholes model that we need to implement. So this is done here. So this is just a Black Scholes equation. So for given uh, call price, initial stock, strike, 
seen tau on R, we always we obtain uh, either call or put option price. So you can see this is uh, if statement that we change um, that we uh, switch whether it's a call or put, and the output is a, an option value. The second ingredient is a derivative of a uh, call price with respect to uh, volatility, with respect to sigma parameter. And as already uh, we discussed earlier, this, uh, this, this derivative is called Viga. So Viga tells you sensitivity of your uh, option value to volatility parameter. And this Viga parameter, uh, Viga coefficient is also known analytically, and this is um, expressed here in these two, two lines. So once we have a Black Scholes uh, formula, we have Viga. As you can see in Viga, we don't uh, the Viga function does not depend uh, on a call or put. So Viga actually it is uh, for either call or put option is the same. So that's uh, something to keep in mind. And the the main core of this uh, uh, code is of course the computation of impact volatility. So what are the inputs? We have a Call or put price. So this is the, uh, the setting. We have initial stock. We have a strike. We have also sigma. This sigma here is an input. So it's an initial sigma that is used in the evaluation. And then we have a tau time to maturity and interest rate. Um, the iteration we start with specification of uh, initial error. So this typically you should, should choose this uh, parameter to be very large. Uh, if it's too small, then calibration could stop immediately on the first iteration that is not really uh, uh, preferred. Then we define two uh, lambda expression. The first lambda expression is for uh, Black Scholes option price given sigma parameter. So whenever we call option price at sigma, then we, this function will be called and the value, so this function will be called and the value will be returned for an option. The second parameter is Vika. So we we express this as a, a lambda expression. So it's a shortcut um, pointer approach to, to get a, a function holder. Um, then we have an iteration. So this n here, this is not really relevant. I'll we'll show you in a few seconds what is the intention of n parameter. So we have a while loop where we, uh, where we iterate, where we basically Iterate as long as the error is bigger than 10 to uh, minus 10. So it's a very small uh, end condition, satisfaction, that, that the condition that needs to be satisfied before the iteration process will stop. And then, of course, if your problem does not converge, uh, then this while loop may uh, run forever. So uh, it is typically recommended that uh, we also have a running index. So if this index would be too large, that iteration should also start uh, with some error message stating that uh, the algorithm did not converge. But now we, we consider a very simplistic case, uh, so we don't really, uh, we are not concerned about that. But in production, if you have this implementation in a training platform, then indeed that's uh, necessary to, to have that implemented. Um, we define f, so um, as we are already seen in the, in pre, in the slides, uh, or if here is actually G. So remember, G function is a difference between um, V market and so option value given in the market and uh, option price, so opt price, which is computed here using the lambda expression. Uh, here, maybe some improvement could be done to this code because I see that the V market it's used as a global parameter, uh, but preferably we would like to keep this parameter as the input of this function. So this is what you the, imp the improvement that you can do yourself. We have a function g. We have also derivative of function g, which is a viga. In this case, you see that we define as a minus here. So uh, we keep a minus the term here because we calculate the um, derivative of function g. So it's a minus sign that's here. Of course, we can simply switch it and have the following expression. So we have a uh, uh, value of a Black Scholes equation minus market price if, uh, uh, of a call or put price. And then we have a derivative with respect to sigma is simply uh, uh, simply Vika. And here, the iteration process, we have a, a sigma minus 
here we have a g minus g prime. And this should be already enough. So what happens, we compute basically the iterative process that we described in the slides. And we have, a, uh, we define an error, which is, uh, as you can see, is defined in terms of uh, uh, difference between iterations. So in every iteration, our sigma will be updated. And if sigma becomes the differences between two consecutive sigmas is small, then uh, we define this as the, uh, is the error. Of course, that's not necessarily uh, uh, true that if we have such a small sigma, that if the difference between two sigmas is very small, that does not mean, of course, that the, the error or the, the, the implied volatility is found. But this is typically one of the possibilities. Um, in a few minutes, we also, a few seconds, we also try to different approach. So if we run it, we can easily, we can, I also plotted some uh, information message. So we see that we have implied volatility of a call price of two for strike 120, maturity of one, interest rate of 5% initial stock. And this is the implied volatility we have found. Uh, what we can also check, which is informative, is that how many iterations it took. So if I run this code again, you could see that Every iteration, we report also the error. So you see how it converges. It converges very fast. Yeah, we also had this. We have seen it in the in the lecture that it is you know, h squared. So it's a rather fast convergence. And then what else? What we can do? We can, uh, as already mentioned a second ago, we can also do error in terms of uh, difference. So actually here, our error is function g, right? So it's a g is defined by the difference between Black Scholes price. Or given sigma market value. So you can see now we have uh, five iterations with 10 to minus 12. Let's see how how result will improve now. We see that we have um, also five iterations. Of course, now the, the meaning of the error is different. It's not only about the difference of the uh, volatility parameter, but now we are talking about the difference in uh, market price versus model price for given sigma parameter. So this is what we see here. Of course, the question, the, the final question is that uh, if we found sigma, found implied volatility, uh, how we know that this is actually uh, um, the, the implied volatility which satisfies the condition? And for that, we can uh, do the following. This is what we, we see here. We compute implied volatility, we compute price for sigma, which is computed from the iteration procedure. And then we can basically, uh, and we can see whether the British source price equals the price that we started with. So the price of an option that we have derived initially we started with was two. We expect that the price of Black Scholes equation will be also two for that implied volatility. And we can see this message here. So in option price for implied volatility of uh, 16%, and that 16% was found in the algorithm, the search algorithm is equal to two. So it's a very, you see, very, very accurate result. Now let us. Uh, test a bit further uh, how the convergence will change if we have an initial guess, which is further away. So you see that our initial guess is 10%. However, the market uh, market uh, implied volatility that we see, it is 16%. So it is not, uh, not exactly, uh, it's rather close, right? So it is in a range of uh, uh, convergence. So let's try to make initial to, let's say, uh, 13%. So we have a 13% initial volatility, and we check how fast the convergence, uh, how fast we get the convergence. So we, before we had five iterations, now we still have five. You see, it's uh, actually convert even uh, faster. Let's try to make it uh, 1% instead of 60. Actually, you see, we already have a problem. So uh, did not want to converge. So you see that basically, uh, initial guess is a very crucial once we talk about uh, uh, calibration. Here, if I have 5%, we have eight iterations. Let's see if we have four, it also stopped to converge. So this means that uh, it was too far away from the, from the uh, true value. So for that, you see, it is very important to have an initial value for volatility to be sufficiently close to your uh, to your exact to your uh, real input volatility. Uh, so, like I said before, uh, typically what will be done in industry is that 
different uh, initial volatilities to be tried. And once the model succeeds, that volatility, that initial class will be chosen. So this is something that you can also consider in your uh, uh, coding. We have 5% that was problem, so 5% was problematic. Uh, let's say for five, for seven. Okay, this is also still works. On the other hand, let's say we have uh, 100%. So we have 120, let's say 5%. Okay, that works very well. If I have 200%, also works well. So you see, uh, the problem part, problematic part, is when we have uh, initial volatility, which is close to zero. Then we see that the gradient search does not work. And that could be related to the to this G prime that we uh, uh, we have. Uh, another way we could also think of a put option that I'm not sure where this would help here. Uh, but typically, the initial sigma it's a very important parameter that you have to think and choose very carefully to calculate that. So once we know how to compute implant volatilities, let us take a look. Uh, how implant volatilities, what kind of shapes we can expect from the market. So um, in this slide, on the left-hand side, we see uh, implant volatility. This is, these are the call prices. So here's a call price, call option prices. And on the right-hand side, we have implant volatilities. In Actually, this is not percent, so we should multiply. So this number, it's, you see, for example, 0 0.4 or 0 0.2. So it's a 20%. So we see that for calls, for call option prices, which are plot against strike, so for every strike, we see call values. And we then on the right-hand side, we see corresponding impact volatilities. It's difficult to relate one figure to another one, right? So if we have a picture when we plot call values against strikes, it's very difficult to compute what is the corresponding impact volatility. In this case, we see that for every strike, we have used uh, flat implied volatility curve. So this means that to generate this implied volatility, uh, this price is here, flat implied volatility or constant volatility was used. Uh, okay, uh, one question we, co we can of course have is that if I give you a figure like this with uh, all prices, when you can conclude, what, how you can check whether uh, the prices that you see are uh, correct or making some sense. For that, we have to look at uh, uh, specification or more details about what calls and puts are. So, uh, from mathematical perspective, we know that a call value it is an expectation under risk neutral measure of uh, 1 over mt, this is a money savings account, times the value of a payoff. So, let's consider just a call option that we have also seen in the slide. So, we have maximum, maximum st, so payment at the maturity minus strike zero. So what I typically do is I choose strike equal to zero. This means that maximum, uh, since stock value is always positive, then this expectation simplifies. We have an expectation on the risk neutral measure over, and we here on the this term, all this, this term is equal to st. So we have st over m T. And this resembles uh, what we have seen already previously, that we know that under risk neutral measure, a stock discounted stock value, so the future value of a stock discounted to today, should be equal to uh, initial value of a stock T0, M T0, and M T0, so M T0 is equal to 1. So this is equal to S T0. This is the smart yield property we have discussed already previously. So this means that if you plot, if you have a graph where we have strikes and we have also call prices, so we have a call value. If we have picture which essentially resembles like this, so this is something we have seen in the previous slide, we know that if we have strike equal to zero, the value at strike equal to zero, so k equals to zero, the value you hear should be S T zero. This is what we can always conclude. So once we have uh, we have simulated, for example, Monte Carlo paths, or we have performed PD simulation, or whatever you have done to derive option prices, I always tend and I always recommend to try what is your option value at strike equal to zero. 
at strike equal to zero, you should always arrive at initial, but you should always arrive at the stock at time t0. So let's take, let's go back to our slides. Um, this, this relation as between implied volatilities and call option prices is particularly difficult if we look at the market. So here we have a, a model case. So we have a model generated call option price from constant implied volatility, constant sigma parameters, so we say sigma. On this figure, in this picture, we see something slightly different. We see also call option prices, which resemble in shape what we have seen previously for constant implied volatility. But in this case, implied volatilities are not constant anymore. So you see the 20% that we have seen in the previous graph is around this level. So you see that for every strike, we have a different implied volatility. This also means that if we would think of a fitting Black-Scholes model to those option prices, that would be impossible because we have only one parameter to fit to implied volatilities, and we have uh, only one corresponding price that we could calibrate. So uh, the flexibility of Black-Scholes model is, uh, is limited to only to one particular strike. So if here we have, uh, this is our add the money option, and we calibrate to that particular implied volatility, of course, then for every strike, we would get a flat implied volatility. Of course, you can ask why people still use Black-Scholes model, uh, why they don't use more advanced model. So uh, the answer to this question is as follows. Uh, if you don't need to use more complicated model than Black-Scholes, you stick to Black-Scholes. And when it is not, uh, when it is good enough, Black Scholes. So, if, for example, you price a single option with one particular strike, then obviously Black Scholes model is enough. You don't need to think of a, a model with many parameters uh, because it's uh, at the end, it's too much. So, at the end, you don't need to do that uh, because, for example, if you have one option with one particular strike and a market gives you implied black shots implied volatility for the price and you have used let's say the stone model or models that we will discuss also later in this course with many parameters if you calibrated your model well this model will be calibrated to the price which is given in the market so if market gives you implied volatility for one particular strike your advanced model will also fit nicely to that but that's not necessary because you can also achieve that with a black shows the black shows model so this means that if you try a single option with one particular strike, there is no need to do to apply more advanced model. Model with a, a single parameter like Black Scholes is just enough. Of course, the situation changes if you are asked to perform a pricing of a derivative, which would depend not only one particular strike, but would depend on multiple strikes or would be time dependent. Then obviously. Uh, application of the usage of Black Scholes model is not uh, not uh, not suitable for it because we are missing their flexibility. So if your payoff would depend, for, let's say, of a tail of a distribution uh, and not particular point, then Black Scholes model would not be enough. So once we generate implied volatilities for given set of strikes for given put or call option. Uh, the question you can ask yourself, uh, what are the shapes that you can expect to see once you plot implied volatilities against strike? So typically we see three different shapes. Uh, there could be a little bit more, but uh, those are the three most popular, most common to observe. The first one, so in this case, we uh, in all these three figures, we have at the money level, which is around uh, at the money, which is around one. So this is on the money level here and also around here. So the first we have uh, implant volatility, implant volatility, which resembles smile. So as you can see, it is a smile, right? So uh, this is implied volatility smile shape, uh, where we see that for uh, strikes which are going to zero or going to uh, are increasing, then implied volatility uh, uh, increases. So we have a bottom around at the money, but this is not necessary. So bottom, the lowest point of a smile may be actually in a in an area a region around uh, the lowest point, but at the money maybe also here, for example, or there. This is not. Uh, if you see a bottom, 
in this input volatility shape, it does not necessarily mean that this is input volatility at demand. So that's uh, something to keep in mind. Uh, so we see that if we go further away from uh, uh, up demand in either direction, the implied volatility increases. Um, the question, of course, one could ask why we observe uh, such an increase in volatilities. Um, this is related to uh, out of the money options. So input volatilities, how they are uh, bolted in the market is as follows. So typically the most liquid instruments are the out of the money uh, puts, so on the left hand side we have out of the money put options, put options, and the most liquid are also out of the money calls. So uh, based on those, we construct implied volatility. So the, those are actually most liquid instruments that we can see in the market for uh, uh, call and put options. So if you uh, typically, so how, how to think about it is that uh, if you have a strike of 100, typically there'll be much more contracts with, uh, if you have a call option, let's say, that you could call it by at the higher level, strike, which is much higher. Otherwise, the option becomes very expensive because if you have a call option with a, so if we have a call option with an ST0 equal to 100 and strike we have equal to, let's say, uh, 50, this means that the option, if you think of a, uh, a call price, that maximum we have an ST minus K0. So we already see that intrinsic value, so at time T0, value will be maximum of 150. So the option, so this is basically heuristic how you can think about it, that uh, if your initial is already much higher than a strike, that the value of an option is at least 50, because this is, you are so much far away from the, uh, from the strike. Yeah? So you can basically, you can buy 50, and you can, and the market value is today 100, so it's very expensive options. And the option market is typically associated with uh, values which are lower. So this option will be much cheaper if we have a strike which is uh, much larger. So if it is exceeds uh, uh, our initial point. So for example, here we would have 120. You see that it's 100 minus 120. So the value, if we take expectation of this contract, will be much less than before. In the case when we have uh, uh, when we had a um, uh, strike of 50, then this price is much this option is much cheaper. And those are typically the most liquid ones. So imagine that you have an option uh, which is deep out of the money. This means that its value is close to zero. So suppose its value is let's say five euro cents. Uh, if a value of an option is five euro cents, very likely the person who sells this option will not ask you for five cents, but will ask you for 10 cents. So you see that the value of an option, or let's say even one euro, for example. Uh, so you see that although the market value was five cents, somebody is asking you extra price. And that difference between the market price and the model price is actually expressed that implied volatility will need to increase too much. So this is what you can see why the implied volatilities are increasing, they are increasing as far you're going from uh, at the money. The second shape of uh, implied volatility is so-called implied volatility skew. So when the volatility is high when uh, uh, for low strikes and it decreases so like a, there is a downward slope. This is uh, implied volatility skew. We also have a stochastic when you see it's a decreasing, and then we have a so-called implied volatility smoke when implied volatility actually the last still reaching the crossing of the money further on it actually doesn't go down but in slightly increases. So that's a, it, it resembles the shape of a hockey stick. Okay, another parameter that we, we didn't think or we didn't discuss it yet is that what would happen if you have a black Scholes equation? So uh, suppose we have, a, let's maybe go further to the note here. If we have a black Scholes equation with, cost, with time dependent uh, volatility parameter. So if your D and T is equal to R S T D T plus C T S T D W T. 
So the question here, this is not the greatest DW, but I mean, the question is, the question is, how will your model improve if instead of constant sigma, so typically before we had constant sigma, now we have time dependent sigma. What will change? Can we actually generate implied volatility smile or skew? Or it basically, uh, it doesn't have any added value. And the answer to this question, um, it is discussed in our book also, but uh, this effect, when we consider instead of constant, we have time dependent volatility uh, for Black Scholes model, does not really improve uh, implant volatility and then smile or skew. You cannot generate that. However, you can have uh, implied volatility uh, term structure. And this means that the volatility, implied volatility, it will behave differently in time. So if your options, you have two options of, let's say, uh, T1 and T2, for both of them, and they're the same strike, so some K, K the implied volatility can vary for those two maturities, but you cannot have fit for different, uh, different strikes. And how to, to think about it? There is a, a small derivation for it, but in essence, you can think that uh, if we have a second model, so we write here D as T is equal to R S T D T plus sigma, and make it sigma hat S T D W T, we can actually prove that. So actually, you should do that everywhere here because those are different processes. So we can actually prove that the distribution that S hat at any time T, let's make it even much simpler. If we have a distribution uh, S at hat, it equals to, uh, in distribution sense, to S at time T. If we have a sigma hat, which is equal to square root one over T integral from zero to t, sigma squared t d t. This is a, a rather straightforward proof. If we know that both distributions, both processes, they follow the normal distribution at every time, uh, this means that we have to find out what is the sigma such that these two parameters for log normal distribution, they will match. So it's a simple exercise. Um, Maybe it's good to also to, to uh, take a look yourself, whether you are able to derive it easily. But in essence, the message is as follows, that if you have uh, two processes, one with time-dependent volatility, one with constant volatility, actually, if you look at the distribution, you are able to find uh, time-dependent or you can find constant volatility parameter such that the distribution will match. This means that uh, implied volatility for any strike Will be the same. So this means you are not able to introduce implied volatility smile in the model, but you can get so-called implied volatility term structure that I would like to uh, discuss further. So if we have implied volatility, which is time, uh, which is uh, uh, time dependent, so this is actually what is plotted here. So here we consider sigma t, which is time dependent. You see, it's increasing in time. So we generated uh, here time dependent volatility. We computed implant volatility so this is a difference here so we don't have a, a implied volatility is not anymore equal to the volatility of a model so we have time dependent volatility from which we compute we generate paths or we compute implant volatility so those are not the same things they are the same things only if we have a, a one parameter so we cannot have time dependence so like i said before if you have a model with uh, multiple parameters and we talk about implant volatility this implant volatility is always black source implant volatility so you take a model you generate prices and you use those prices to calculate to calculate uh, black source implant volatility so implant volatility is always associated with black source model so if we have a model with time dependency this means it's not a standard black source model so to calculate, to calculate implant volatilities, we need to use it in a Black-Scholes equation to get the Black-Scholes implant volatility. And this is what we have. So we have then some kind of term structure volatilities. Uh, so if you have uh, two options, one maturity in here and here, you can see we can fit to those maturities different volatility levels. Here, for example, would be 35%. 
here we have 27. So uh, this is what, what is possible with a time-dependent uh, volatility. Uh, and this is basic. And here we have a case where we have a just simple Black-Scholes equation with constants C, so we have a constant. So that's the difference. And they also, please take a look at that here in the x-axis, we don't have strike anymore, but we have maturity. So this is uh, quite important. So we have learned about different shapes of implant volatilities once we talk about different strikes, as presented here in this graph. Uh, on the other hand, we have also discussed how implant volatility can change once we talk about uh, different maturities. As you can see here, that those volatilities, which are presented in these two graphs, are so-called at the money implant volatilities. At the money, this means that we had uh, s zero equal to k. Of course, similar shapes you would obtain if you vary your uh, strike. So strike could have different numbers, uh, and as you can imagine, uh, there is not there is no only one strike. There are multiple strikes. So the complexity it's rather uh, high. Uh, so, if we think of multiple strikes, we have also uh, seen multiple maturity, like here, for example, we have five years, but often you can see also options with uh, much longer maturities, even up to 30 or 40 years. So, if we have multiple strikes, multiple maturities, we can put them together, and then we obtain so-called implied volatility surface. So, this is a surface, those are uh, very important elements once we talk about volatilities and also of, uh, later that we will discuss about uh, stochastic volatility models and calibration. So let's take a look. So first of all, uh, we see that we have uh, different strikes levels. So here is uh, the money level in these graphs. And here we have different maturities. So as you can see, if I take particular maturity, let's say short maturity, we have uh, a smile for given maturity. So once we have, uh, we go further in time, we see that the smile is, uh, you can think it's a bit wider, broader. If you have a short maturity, if you go to the to the expire, which is sooner than later, then you see that implant volatility uh, smile is much more pronounced. And uh, how to think about it is that if you have a, a, a graph, so if we have a, a maturity, which is, let's say, close to today, so let's make it uh, about one year, and we have here at the money level, then we can imagine that uncertainty about the stock price is here. Maybe I should make a bit nicer distribution. So this is what the distribution you can think of a stock. So if you would have a model uh, that you would use to, let's say, generate paths or you compute distribution of a stock, as it's called T1, and here T1 is smaller than one. So you, you can expect that stock will move within a year um, to some level, but it won't go tenfold. Uh, of course, if it's a special stock like Tesla, for example, indeed, it could go tenfold within a week. But in general, that would not be the case. On the other hand, if I have a longer maturity, so I have, let's say, maturity of, uh, uh, let's consider it's T2, maybe 20 years, you would expect that... Uh, the distribution of a stock in the future will be much broader, right? So you expect that this is also something that we discussed uh, previously, that uh, our volatility of a process is typically determined by volatility parameter by plus square root of time. So longer we wait, more uncertainty. This means that initial, if it's a super short maturity option, it will be very much concentrated about uh, at the money level. So this would be case, for example, if I have a, an option which has expiration tomorrow, you will not expire, uh, expect that uncertainty until tomorrow will be very big. You would expect to be very much narrow, close to today. So then you will have a, a very much accumulated distribution around at the money. Longer going time, wider distribution. If you have XP, it could also happen a distribution uh, density distribution function goes as follows, if you have, let's say, 50 or 100 tiers. So this is also what is kind of represented here. So uh, if you have a short maturity, uh, the smile, the distribution is very much accumulated around the demand level. And later you go, or uh, longer the maturity of the option, 
the distribution diffuses. This is what typically we have. You see, it diffuses with time. So it diffuses with time, and then the smile effect becomes less and less pronounced. So here we have on the left-hand side, we have uh, yeah, pronounced good opportunities. In here, it is a slightly different figure where we see that uh, uh, the curvature is much more pronounced. Yeah? So this basically figure shows you that smile changes into more into skew. So you can have this kind of composition when you have uh, initially volatility is very much smiling and then diffuses into skew. Here it's much less. So you, we have a smile and distribution or actually the implant volatility resembles in the steel smile shape. So you can see that longer maturity of smile here and short maturity we have smile there. And here we had the rather smile here and here we had the skew there. So, so this is the difference. In, in practice, you will see multiple different shapes of implant volatility. And uh, sometimes you can find maybe on YouTube or on other media uh, how volatility surface evaluates in time, which is kind of interesting. However, it is difficult to conclude from here uh, whether uh, what is exactly the reason for it. So that's basically more as a phenomena that we observe. So keep in mind that this is always when we talk about implant volatility, I will repeat myself and think for the third time now, this is always Black-Scholes implant volatility. And Black-Scholes model will be only able to calibrate to one point in the grid. So if you have Black-Scholes model, you could calibrate to this point, you get one sigma. If you calibrate to this point, you have another sigma, sigma one, sigma two. If you have this point, sigma three, and so on. So every point on this grid is one, you can think of one Black-Scholes model. The same would be for this case, for this grid. Every point, you can only calibrate one Black-Scholes model. If you have a time dependent, time dependence, you could calibrate only to this, let's say, at the money level. The same would be here. You can only calibrate to term structure, nothing more. So everything outside at the money, it is uh, your model, Black-Scholes model cannot calibrate. So that's something to, to keep in mind. Uh, we presented these figures here um, because they are uh, really uh, and they're fitting well to the story and also they give you understanding what are the limitations of Black-Scholes model, where you can actually fit it, when you can use it. So if you have a contract which uh, requires uh, Let's say it depends not only on the particular level, but depends on evaluation of your paths in time, then Black-Scholes model may be not suited because this means that actually implant volatility outside this at the money level will be flat. So whenever you choose a model, you always have to think uh, what is the purpose of the model, whether it's not too complicated, because if you have European option and you have, let's say, very complicated model, uh, you will not perform better than if somebody would use Black Scholes. However, if you use Black Scholes for very complicated payoff or very com complicated contract, then you are uh, undervaluing very likely because you're not able to uh, fit well to the not only at the money levels. So let us summarize what we have learned so far about the Black-Scholes model and its limitations. Um, I would like to start with um, stating that although Black-Scholes model is not ideal, it is one of the most important models in finance. It's a, a fundamental model which gives you a lot of insight in uh, pricing of derivatives, in, about the construction of a replicating portfolio, hedging, and also simulating. So by simple Black-Scholes model, uh, you can really learn a lot about uh, derivative pricing. Uh, going indeed into more advanced and uh, complicated models, it is necessary if we uh, want to apply them to, let's say, if you are thinking of uh, uh, pricing of uh, exotic derivative, then Black-Scholes model is not uh, sufficient. However, although one-dimensional, although with constant parameters, uh, Black-Scholes model gives you a lot of insight uh, how to perform hedging, uh, how to understand market movements and how to uh, um, think of different model scenarios. So, uh, first of all, um, Black-Scholes model, it's not perfect, right? So we already know that from, uh, from our uh, uh, first courses, first lectures. Uh, one of the big limitations is that in a model that we have derived, uh, 
the hedging is supposed to be continued process. And as you remember, we constructed a replicating portfolio where we had a, a value of an option. So we had an option and also we had delta stocks. And in order to derive the dynamics, uh, we assumed that the hedging strategy will take on a basis on a continuous basis. This means that we continuously would calibrate or we would derive delta, which is derivative of a value of a option with respect to a stock. And we continuously would rebalance our portfolio such that our value of a portfolio would on average give us the same rate of return as we would invest in the money savings account. And uh, but that, require, that requirement uh, is very impractical. In reality, uh, continuously buying and selling stock would be very expensive. Imagine you are doing this hundreds of times a day and for every time you buy or sell stock, you need to pay transaction costs. So this is a very expensive process. In reality, hedging takes place on much more uh, less frequent, on less frequent basis. Um, typically, it is done on a daily basis, uh, maybe weekly or sometimes monthly. Um, the frequency of hedging depends on uh, market behavior. So if market is uh, uh, very uh, volatile, if all the components in the market move a lot, then in order to manage your position well, uh, then you have to hedge on a very frequent basis. However, if market is uh, uh, rather stable and you apply, for example, Black Scholes model to uh, a market which is not so much volatile, it's very stable, interest rates and other parameters, they don't change, then hedging uh, maybe is not necessary even to do it on a so frequent basis. Uh, but in a if you have a volatile market, then hedges uh, need to be done on a very frequent basis. And that argument, let's say the transaction costs and also infrequent hedges are not taken into account in the Black Scholes model. So that doesn't really express what is the, uh, the real cost of your uh, derivative. Okay. Um, also, another argument is that um, another limitation of the model is that empirical studies of financial time series have revealed that the normality assumption of asset prices cannot capture heavy tails. Um, and this is what we have seen already uh, once we were looking at uh, uh, implied volatilities. We were looking at implied volatilities outside out of the money and outside the money level. They are not well fit by the, uh, by the Black Scholes model. On the other hand, if you look at the uh, it's something that we already discussed in the first lecture. If we look at the uh, uh, log returns, or actually we look at the returns, which are defined as uh, DST over ST, which could be approximated from historical data by S E plus delta T minus ST. This is what we can think of returns defined by ST. Um, in Black Scholes case, that would uh, which in the log space also would resemble very uh, distribution with a very uh, non-fat tails. So actually, maybe this tail is a bit fat here, but we can think of a distribution which tails are, uh, are very much limited in a certain area. So 99.9% .9 of observations uh, of probability is within a specified limit. In reality, however, uh, there could be events which take place outside this uh, uh, range. So this means that Black Scholes model or log normal, log normal distribution is not enough heavy tailed. This means that probability which is assigned to extreme events is very, very low and that uh, it is confirmed also in historical data. So uh, I think the, the, the good estimate is that according to Black Scholes models, uh, crashes and uh, market crashes that we have seen a couple of years ago, they should happen once in a century. However, they happen much more frequently. They happen more on a 10-year uh, a basis. So this is something that is not well uh, described and captured by the log normal distribution. Later in this course, and actually comic lecture, we will discuss models that can actually improve that. So the, the models which will have fatter distribution. So then the distribution, which is essentially has a fatter tail. So this is will be discussed in the next lecture. Uh, something that we put also quite some attention to was uh, uh, implied volatility smile and skew. Um, it's not captured in the Black Scholes model. And this is the limitation because of the volatility parameter, which is just simple constant. So constant as assumption of constant volatility 
it's not realistic, uh, especially if we have option market with uh, multiple strikes. So then we cannot really think, say that this is a good, a good assumption. Okay. Um, so the idea of implied volatility that does not fit well to Black Scholes model. So um, this is what we have seen, and um, market and also literature uh, in market and literature there are different approaches to handle that problem. So um, there is a uh, one class of models, so-called local volatility models, that can handle it very well. Uh, local volatility model is uh, it looks very uh, very simple. So it is basically a small extension of Black Scholes model. So we have dst equals to power s t d t plus we have a function of s t d w t and this function um, it is so called a local volatility function because uh, this function is cons um, it, it does not directly depend on a stock but depends also on market calls of call and put options. So it's a very complicated function that to construct, you need a lot of input market data, uh, but that's a local volatility function. Uh, we In this course, we won't go into details about construction of this model. It will be described in the follow-up course. A second approach that we will actually discuss next time, it's a model of jumps. So then we have a stochastic differential equation, let's say Black-Scholes model with R, R, S, T, D, T plus sigma, sigma S, T, D, W, T. And then we have uh, some uh, jump process. So we can call it, let's call it eta, D, N, T. So we see that we have uh, a drift. We have a diffusion. And we also have a jump. By including jump, so here is a, you see that we have a Brownian motion here. Here, uh, a jump process would be the Poisson process, uh, and those two will be uh, uncorrelated, so independent. By inclusion of jumps uh, to Black Scholes equation, we are actually able to get smile effect, uh, well uh, calibrated smile effect. Uh, maybe it's not very well because the model it also um, has many parameters. Uh, but it allows us to generate smile and skews in the model. Uh, and the third class, so something that we also discuss, so local volatility, it won't be discussed in this course. Uh, models with jumps well and stochastic volatility will. Stochastic volatility is a rather a more advanced extension of local volatility. At least it looks like it is because it involves multiple dimensions. However, the construction of function f in local volatility, it is very not straightforward. So uh, this will be discussed definitely in a, in a follow-up course. So for stochastic volatility models, uh, we could think of the following. We have a dst is equal to r s t d t. So it's exactly as in all these three models. Plus we have, a, a, let's call it v t d w t and vt so d t is another stochastic process second stochastic process and here we can have a, for example mu dt plus uh, eta dw so this is st classic stochastic volatility models this means that the volatility volatility parameter volatility is driven by a stochastic differential equation so it's a uh, uh, stochastic, so volatility is stochastic. This is why it's stochastic volatility. Your local volatility is because it's just a function of S. The model of jumps is geometric by motion, for example, with a jump process. So this uh, this model, the jump model, and also uh, stochastic volatility models will be discussed in the follow-up lectures.